let me make an analogy an analogy between programs and recipes so a program is a lot like a recipe each one is a list of steps to be carried out with rules for how to tell when you're done or when to go back at the end there's a certain result if you cook you probably exchange recipes with your friends and you probably change recipes too and if you've made changes and you like the results and your friends like eating it then you might give them the, the change version of the recipe so imagine a world where you can't change a recipe because somebody has gone out of his way to set it up so that it's impossible to change it and imagine that if you share the recipe with your friends they will call you a pirate and try to put you in prison for years I use the word hacker in its correct and original sense to describe a person who pursues computer programming as a kind of artistic passion and who also is part of or identifies with the hacker culture, which is a group of programmers historically that has produced the internet and Linux and the World Wide Web. I guess you have to be a hacker in order to understand the specific mindset. That is, to rebel against the idea that the underlying source code for a computer operating system should be withheld. This open source attitude doesn't mix smoothly with the concept of free market economy. It is also a threat to the traditional concepts of copyright and intellectual property. Companies like Microsoft, that base their business on closed source code, have tactically molded free software into an image of a monster, of almost McCarthyan proportions. All this made up one of the strangest success stories of the 1990s, epitomized by the community's gifted leader and invaluable icon, who planted the seed for a movement whose ramifications continue to spread. Linus Torvalds has created a data system that has led the whole branch of Medhetman. Linux, an operating system that now runs 8 million of the world's computers. Wired lehti julistaa tämän nuoren miehen Väinämöisen veroiseksi shamaaniksi, jonka kehittämä Linux-käyttöjärjestelmä on internetin upein mestarituote. Torvalds' decision to distribute Linux for free and reveal its underlying source code has made him a quasi cult figure. Linus Turvas data geniet som drömmer om att fälla Microsoft jätten Bill Gates who got it. Det finns de som säger att Linus Turvals har åstadkommit ett mirakel. These worker ants are constantly in contact with each other by modems. Releasing code, encouraging feedback and modifications to create the best possible operating system in the world. I didn't want anybody else to have to go through the same thing I had. We were trying to find something like Linux, so I decided, hmm, maybe some other computer science student out there needs his own operating system, then he doesn't have to start from scratch. It wasn't the big fight against the windmills, it was not Don Quixote against the world trying to, to make a better place. I much prefer working with people over email than than face to face. Face to face you tend to get into all these meeting arguments and all the details that really shouldn't matter. 
Over email, you have to kind of think a bit before you send off a reply. Just because we're not in the same place doesn't mean that we, we aren't sort of together in a social sense. It's like one very, very large shared office. We even have our arguments and squabbles over the internet in the same kind of way. I mean, this is a huge project. There has never been a software project that I know of that's been worked on by so many people from so many dispersed places to put this all together. The most innovative thing about the Linux community is not its source code, but the social machine that has developed around the source code. What Linux is, uh, I suppose I would say, uh, every computer is different. Every 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 floppy disk is drive is different, every hard disk is different, every every uh, video controller is different, and Linux is the thing that knows how to make all these different kinds of parts on a computer do the simple task, things that, that people would consider a simple task, like write my file out to the disk, or read this file off this floppy I have, or draw this image on the screen. Linux knows how to talk to these different pieces of hardware and make them do the common operations that we need com computers to do every day. What do we mean when we say Linux? Some mean the whole computer operating system on which everything that happens in a computer lays. Some say Linux, pinpointing at the single most important program, the kernel. It has to go back to the person who started it, to the person who somehow used the net to create a community of people who all felt that their contributions were being valued. And that ability to foster cooperation could very well be something that could only come from a person raised in a country like Finland. Nineteen sixty nine. It seems to have been such a good year. The landing of the moon, Woodstock, the birth of ARPANET that led to Internet. The first steps of Unix, the operating system for big computers. And on the twenty eighth of December, Linus Torvalds is born. <laughs> Och den orsaken tror jag det var till och med oerhört viktigt för Linus att han, att han kom in i datavärlden när datamaskiner ännu var så enkla att det också för en 10-12-årig pojke var lätt att begripa vad som fanns inne i den här maskinen. I dagens värld så finns det redan så många lager av information och av bilder och invecklade grejer emellan. Det, där, det som kommer ut i datamaskinens skärm och det som finns bakom minne i maskinen, att det tror jag är oerhört svårt för dagens pojkar och flickor att leka sig fram till, till den insikt som Linus lekte sig fram till. Jag tror det var kärlek vid första ögon, kanske både, både för min pappa och, och för Linus som tillsammans var barnsligt förtjusta, båda två i att pröva de möjligheter som vi tjog. Platsen där Linus utvecklar Linux finns ju inte mer eftersom väggarna har rivit. Här i det här hörnet, eller ungefär här i, som nu är soffa, så, så var Linus skrivbord och, och dator som han jobbar med. Jag skulle säga att den största förändringen är, är faktiskt just, just det att han är så Numera är som jag brukar säga en stand-up guru för att han är van att uppträda för publik och han kan ta sin publik. Det är kanske inte förvånande men, men i alla fall frapperande när, när man jämför med hur han faktiskt var. Och det där relativt blyg och tillbakadragen och inte den som själv tog kontakt utan hans vänner var de som höll kontakt med honom. 
Hello everybody out there using Minix. I'm doing a free operating system, just a hobby. Won't be big and professional like GNU for 386 and 486 AT clones. This has been brewing since April and is starting to get ready. I'd like any feedback on things people like or dislike in Minix, as my OS resembles it somewhat. Any suggestions are welcome, but I won't promise I'll actually implement them. Linus Torvalds at Krona Helsinki Fee. 1991. The Soviet Union closes down. The Gulf War. British physicist Tim Berners-Lee releases a hypertext system, calling it the World Wide Web. Microsoft is well on the way for world domination. And on the 17th of September, Linux Torvalds sends the first version of Linux 0.01 to the world via internet. The first responses arrive within hours. Siitä hän alkoi ensin kuulua tuolla kahvilassa kertomuksia, että tällainen ohjelmisto on ja että se on alkanut levitä. Ja, ja tästä Linuksesta kuultiin myös sitten, että mikä hän on miehiä. Kyllä hän niin oli herättänyt huomiota laitoksella kyvyillään siihen mennessä. Linus based Linux on Unix because of its basic ideals. The original Unix operating system had been created by Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie at AT&T's Bell Labs in 1969. Unix was in the beginning a relatively free operating system and very popular in university circles. The philosophy is based on two notions. Firstly, everything is a file. Secondly, when you build something, you write things that are for a single purpose, but that do that purpose well. Putting Linux out on the net was kind of the natural thing to do in, in many ways. And there were a lot of small reasons, like the fact that, that I thought it was a good idea anyway to, to make Linux available to others so that they could try it out and, and send comments back to, to me. He really had two choices. He could make it completely free or he could try and charge for it. Linuxista ei olisi tullut yhtään mitään, jos hän olisi ottanut siitä taloudellista hyötyä, myynyt sitä. Ei kukaan olisi ostanut sitä. Se olisi ollut ihan dead end. Siitä onkin vähän aikaa, kun täällä viimeksi olet käynyt, että Joo. tässä on jo vaihdettu Linuxin jakelukone kolmanteen eri ve uuteen versioon. Että... Meillä oli aluksi vaikeuksia saada Linux-kamat mahtumaan, niin näin oli joo. Oli... Alun perin oli Linus ei halunnut se. julkistaa Linuxia mitenkään vapaaksi. Se mietti sitä hyvin pitkään, että minkälaisen copyrightin alle Linux laitetaan. Ja sitten mä sain pikkuhiljaa yli puhuttua Linusin julkistamaan Linuxin GNU-copyrightin alla. Especially as, as the compiler I used was released under the GPL, I eventually ended up using the GPL myself. The GNU General Public License, GPL, funded by the Free Software Foundation in the mid-1980s, says that if you change and modify the code, you have to make your changes and improvements freely available to anyone. The GPL hinders any one person to have a monopoly over an important piece of technology. I think that, that the timing was definitely, uh, uh, even just a year earlier, I don't think it could have been done. 
and a year later somebody else would have done something similar. The internet was basically, hadn't gotten started in, in, in kind of the general population, but it, it was getting very strong in, in university networks. Mä olin tehnyt siellä postituslista ohjelmiston ja sitä piti koko ajan laajentaa sinne lisää ominaisuuksia. Ihmisiä alkoi olemaan tuhansia hyvin varhaisessa vaiheessa jo kiinnostuneita. Se oli varsinainen yllätys, koska se, se niin kuin tuplaantui aika pienin aikavälein. Se on ihan käsittämätöntä, että tuhannesta ihmisestä tulee seuraavana päivänä 2000 ihmistä ja sitten tulee 4000 sitä seuraavana. Joo, ilman internettiä se Linuxin kehittäminen on ollut kirjesakkia. My name of choice was Freaks, uh, F-R-E-A-X, uh, which was both the free and freak plus the X that you need to have for Unix. En tykänny ajatuksesta nimittää sitä Freaksiksi. Se ei ollut kauhean myyvä nimi. Ari Lemke, who actually put it up for FTP, thought that it really was a bad idea and really hated the name and and uh, he made an, the FTP site available for it and he just called it Linux because he knew that was that was the working name and uh, the name stuck and Linux is the much better name. was in July of 1991, uh, which was shortly after Linus had released the 0.09 version of the kernel, uh, that I started playing with Linux. Heard about it on, I think, Usenet, downloaded it from Finland, started playing with it, thought it was really neat. Um, and at that point, there was very limited transatlantic internet bandwidth. Uh, so it was very painful to download all these packages from Finland. Uh, and so I decided, well, we need to do something about this. And I used my personal workstation that was on my desk, which was tsx11.mit.edu. Uh, and I set up a mirror archive of all the kernel sources on my private workstation. And that was the first um, US Linux FTP site that came into existence. The first time I got Linux was I downloaded the floppy images for Linux, uh, and in the Penn State University computer lab, I installed it on one of their machines, and uh, they, they subsequently kicked me out of the computer lab that day. But that was my first experience with Linux. Fairly early in 92, suddenly I didn't know everybody anymore, that it was no longer uh, me and a couple of friends. It was me and a couple of hundred people who I had no idea where they, where they were, what they did with the system, and and who they are. And that was that was a big step. The 1.0 release in '94 was certainly important, and it meant a lot to me just because there was a lot of work behind it. It was certainly a landmark to commercial use of Linux. It was really hard to use Linux commercially before uh, 1.0. <laughs> kun esimerkiksi Dossi nostaa kotikoneeseen parilla sadalla markalla, niin tuommoinen Unix-kotikoneeseen maksaa helposti parikymmentä tuhatta markkaa. 
mikä on opiskelijalle hiukan liian paljon. Menkää vaikka jonnekin tietokoneen kauppaan, niin kysykää, että onko teillä SCU Unix, niin ne katsoo teitä kysyä ja sanoo, että ei, emme Itse asiassa paljon helpompi kirjoittaa sitten. The development process of Linux is odd. It is not a hierarchy. Everyone is free to suggest and send changes to the code. There is one person who leads, makes the big decisions and chooses the best ideas. Linus, the benevolent dictator. Everyone knew that someone had to be the head of this work group and Linus was the natural head given that he did the original core Linux uh, kernel and Linus was someone who was a very, very good leader. He's someone who's actually quite humble. You know, he doesn't try to take credit for stuff that he doesn't do. You want to have hundreds, thousands of people working on, on the kernel at the same time. But you don't want to have all these people stepping on each other's toes all the time because that way you will just get, most of the time will be spent on just resolving conflicts between people. You just have flame wars all, all the time. I used to think that it was this hierarchy where I was at the top and they were my lieutenants and, and uh, I don't think it's that way anymore. It's more like uh, uh, a web of trust where I have people I trust and they have people they trust. Well, there are lots of things that motivate developers. There's um, artistic pride, uh, the, the satisfaction that you get from doing good craftsmanlike work. There's the idealist feeling of being something larger and uh, more part of something larger and more important than you are. Uh, there's a desire to help the world and see good solutions happen. In the absence of monetary rewards, most people most of the time are playing for a kind of reputation reward among their peers. One strength of the Linux development world is that practically every software author can be contacted directly by email. Ted Tso was crucial in the spread of Linux in the United States. To be fair, it's very easy to say if we were in charge, we wouldn't do these things. But then again, we're not getting all these email messages saying, please, let me add this new feature. Um, and so I don't know what I would actually do if I were really in charge. Dave Miller is a maintainer who reviews changes that developers want to make in the kernel. He's like a funnel between the contributors and the King Linus. The way that we work is you can talk all day about a great idea or a solution to a problem or something that, that you think is an interesting feature for Linux to have. But you've got to show us, show me something concrete. Show me a piece of code that does that. So, so something that's tangible that I can test myself so that I can try it out and I can think about what it is instead of just talking abstractly about a topic all day. Alan Cox, a Renaissance hacker, is the closest collaborator to Linus, his right-hand man. To me, code has more in common with, for example, poetry or some kinds of writing. And the beauty of it is in structure, in putting ideas across one at a time in a clear way. So a good piece of code you can read without comments and it's immediately obvious why it's been written, how it's elegant. And so you're looking for code which is both clean and elegant, but also doesn't rely on sort of clever programming tricks, doesn't make assumptions which may not be true in the future. Because the last thing we want to do is to have much code in the Linux kernel, which requires large amounts of effort to keep it working. We want code which will just continue to work and work forever. Having led the Linux project for five years in Helsinki, Linus was recruited to Silicon Valley, California. He wanted to see the other side of the world, the world of commerce, not just the academic side.
you, you're, you're quite an unorthodox figure in the Silicon Valley world. What do they make of you there? You've not taken the, the, the crazy commercial part, if you like. To Latin America. South Vancouver, the top way. You never squat like the Antarctic. You're never alone in Silicon Valley, USA. Seems I was the chosen prodigy. Riding for the summons by Shakespeare. Some saw the balcony, but you didn't even get near. The main did mean Harry the Ed. The beast, we found the web. We probably sell the shares as soon as you can. Get out and go on to the next thing. We're tired of young. Like the Antarctica, southbound Vertigo Parkway. Linux started to work for a company called Transmeta. Not a Linux company, but a mysterious business that didn't want to tell for many years what it was up to. And paradoxically, a closed source code company. The deal was that Linux could still concentrate on developing Linux. I have been forced into trying to be a kind of poster boy for Linux. Uh, and, and actually the whole open source community at large, even though I wasn't even the person who started open source. There's no single person that represents the whole story and there's no single starting point. I mean, it's like the bamboo. You don't know where it starts, where it ends. I don't think that this, this movement is actually new at all. Um, it's been around for a long time. Uh, you know, even in the 70s, you know, the whole attitude that we had around Unix, even though technically it wasn't, it wasn't open source, it wasn't free, um, because you did need to go and get this license from AT&T. But, you know, since that was not an issue generally, you could share things freely. When you run a program, typically you run the executable form, which is a series of numbers. Now, nobody can make any sense of those numbers. Only a computer can understand them. That's what they're for. Those numbers are the way of, are the form of a program that the computer itself can understand. But for humans to figure out what they mean is very hard. When we write software, we write it as source code. Source code looks sort of like algebra. That's the form that you can understand if you're a programmer. To help you figure out, there are usually lots and lots of comments, which are explanations that are put into the source code to help other people figure out why the program is written the way it is. If you get just the executables, which is what Microsoft will probably give you, even if you had the freedom to make changes, you could never figure out what changes to make. It's too hard. For the freedom to change the software to be practical and usable, you've got to have the source code. If you really look at the project, um, if you really look at the, as I said, Linus developed the kernel, but the whole system is really not. I think that the most interesting part here is really Richard Stallman began the movement. Have you heard of Richard Stallman? He wanted everyone to have the rights to use the software, to copy the software without breaking any laws, to make changes, distribute them, give enhance it, right? He wanted to give people rights. When he decided to overthrow corrupt American capitalism in the computer industry, he quit his job and he continued coding. Join us now and share the software. You'll be I tend to think of things in terms of justice, freedom, and ethics. I announced the idea in November 83, and it, but it was in January 84 that I quit my job at MIT to start developing a free operating system to which I gave the name GNU. 
This is GNU, this is GPL, the GNU General Public License. And of course, the kernel is under GPL. Free software, I should explain, refers to freedom, not price. It's unfortunate that the word free in English is ambiguous. It has a number of different meanings. One of them means zero price, but another meaning is that you have freedom. So think of free speech, not free beer. There is a similarity between the folk process where a poem or a song or a story can get refined and reshaped by one teller or singer after another and the way free software gets improved. You'll often find cases where a free program is being developed now by a group of people who include none of the original developers. In 1991, we had almost finished the GNU system. Our goal was to make an operating system like Unix, but entirely free software. This complete operating system required many different components. By 1991, we had almost all of those components. Many of them we had written, and many others we had found somebody else had written it for his own purposes, but it did the job and so we pressed it into service as a part of GNU. One major component was still missing, the component called the kernel. So it was very useful that Linus Torvalds wrote a kernel. At that point, combining his kernel, Linux, with the larger GNU system produced a complete runnable system that you could actually put onto your PC and run. So once Linux was developed, the GNU system, in effect, was completed, and it began to catch on in popularity. But at the same time, an unfortunate thing happened. The people who were using the GNU system didn't realize it was the GNU system. So they began calling the whole combination Linux. And that confusion spread, and as a result, it's very hard for us in the GNU project to call the user's attention to the ethical and political issues. Borders can get piles of money, that is true. Hackers, that is true. But they cannot help their neighbors, that's not good. Hackers, that's not good. Most computer science in the USA comes traditionally from military background and defense spending. Perhaps it isn't any more quirky that nowadays free software movement finds room both for Richard Stallman and libertarian ideals. Many saw free software also as a new way of making money and needed a less radical concept. Enter open source. Uh, we looked at the history of advocacy in uh, what at the time was, st was still mostly called the free software movement, and we concluded that it hadn't worked. That in fact the rhetoric and the tactics used by Richard Stallman and the Free Software Foundation had probably left us worse off than we were when we started. The term open source doesn't really imply a lot of political issues like it used to the, the, the free software term still does. There is now a second movement, the open source movement, where they consider only the practical benefits and they refuse, and I mean that literally, they carefully avoid the issues of principle, freedom, ethics, and making a good society for people to live in. That kind of language is implicitly threatening to people whose day-to-day -day concerns are how do I increase my shareholder value? You know, how do I keep control of my business? How do I address my, 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 my actual 
uh, down to earth problems. People like that, you know, you, when you walk into their offices and say, you should use all open source for your business because sharing is good and hoarding is evil, it doesn't work. It just doesn't, as communication, it fails. I am not against business. I don't believe in abolishing business. I do business myself. But I believe business should not dominate all of life. The rules of society should not be chosen primarily to please business. In early 1998, majority usage in the community went from free software to open source in six weeks flat in the late spring, early summer of 1998. And that told me that there had been huge pent-up demand in the community for a way of, of explaining what we were doing that was, that was more effective. The whole attitude in the trade press and in the investor community completely turned around, 180 degrees. The same people who had spent years and years and years sneering dismissively at free software and you know talking about you know sandal wearing freaks with long hair those very same people within a year were falling all over themselves to write laudatory articles about the wonders of open source and peer review and this was really funny because it was the same software and in most cases the same people <laughs> happened without the help of people with deep pockets, or even despite the help. How can we keep from destroying the magic by pouring all of this money into Linux? When, when Linux started to become commercialized, people said, oh well, you know, we'd like to keep it as our own little project and things like that, and nobody should be making any money off of it. Well, in the real world, people make money off of things. The, you know, in the United States, it's a capitalistic society. In Europe, it's a capitalistic society. And in order for companies to start using Linux, they want to have somebody sitting there who can give them support, who can sell them the hardware, who can do all this type of thing. And these people who sell this hardware and sell the support are going to make money. Not every one of us is a hacker. Actually, very few of us will take the effort to download our own Linux from the net. Even fewer will tackle with the code itself in order to improve it. <laughs> Though Linux was hard to use, customers valued strongly its reliability and open source code. There was an opportunity for companies with new visions. For Red Hat, it wasn't important that we ship a better operating system than Microsoft's or Sun Microsystems. It becomes really important that we ship an operating system that solves a problem for our customers that they cannot solve using the traditional proprietary binary-only software. We're recognizing what we were doing was we were building technology and then giving it away. So we said, well, how do you make money doing this? And, uh, of course, we would go to California, to Silicon Valley, and everyone would say, well, you cannot make money in the software business giving your technology away. And we would come back and we'd talk to our customers and we'd realize the only thing that kept our customers loyal to what we were doing was that we did give away our technology. For the very first time, they had control over the technology they're using. The real value in most software products is the active maintenance down, down the line, the continuing support relationship between the vendor and you. And that's what gives software fundamentally the characteristics of a service industry rather than a manufacturing industry. Linux is flourishing in the Internet Server Appliance area. But because there has not been an easy-to-use software for home users, it has only a small margin of the desktop market. Gnome Project, with its graphical interface, tries to fill that gap. But hacker Elitism still seems to follow Linux. Hey, Evie, you see who's here? Hi. It's a pinguin. Hi. Hi, pinguin. It's Tux, actually. Hi, Tux. 
Samalla kun Linus Turvalsin työ poikii uusia miljonääriä ja miljardööriä, hän aiheuttaa harmaita hiuksia maailman toistaiseksi rikkaimmalle miehelle, Bill Gatesille. Microsoft has a very traditional model. They make closed source code, they put it on a CD, they sell that. Now, and they take on all the burden of development themselves. Everything goes back through them. Once you're in that business, it's very hard to change your culture. It's very hard to change your business to one where you cooperate, where programmers are used to releasing code. It's easier to make money off of closed source products uh, if you uh, don't need to or you have the huge market share. So, for example, um, Microsoft does not have a huge incentive to open source their code right now and it would probably cut into their profits. So they're, I don't think they're going to do it, or at least not willingly. There's um, algorithms that you may in fact want to keep proprietary. For example, I know of certain compression algorithms that companies have put a lot of work into uh, for things like streaming media. And they don't want people to know how they do that because it's exactly how they do that that is the value of their product. Fighting between Linus, who's the leader of Linux, and Bill Gates, who's the, the, the leader of Microsoft, and it becomes really personal. And for our bizarre question, whose lips are these? <laughs> I'd say there's a Bill Gates lips telling another lie. <laughs> the acceptance of Linux has been helped enormously by the fact that people have known that Linux exists through the news. And the David versus Goliath story helped there, but I don't think it was particularly true. You're a socialist. That's one of the labels pe people put on. Is that true? Det var ju ingen hemlighet att tillhörde radikalerna i slutet av 60-talet med gamla studenthus och studenternas FN-förening som organiserade nästan alla demonstrationer på den tiden. My personal belief system is more one of personal honor. And I don't care what anybody else does. Um, I want to do what I feel is right. At Linus håller sig oerhört på ett mycket bestämt avstånd från det där, från, från politik. Och det hänger säkert ihop med att han så att säga skadades lite under sin tidigare, tidigaste barndom av en mycket aktiv och politisk far. It is also about having a social conscience. And if you call that socialism, then yeah, I guess I'm socialist. Att han är radikal inom ett ganska bestämt område där han själv skapar ramarna för sitt område. Eller han går, som jag upplever det, oerhört ogärna ut i det där i lösa, lite flummiga samhällspolitiska resonemang. Och där finns den här skiljelinjen mellan den här pragmatikern som vill syssla med någonting som är kännbart och inte låta liksom ångan åka ut genom det där öronen och flumma iväg om någonting som, som vi gärna gjorde på 60-talet. This is a community you can take, but you must give back. I am very pleased to announce to you today that the winner of this year's IBG Linus Torvalds Award is Debbie. Debbie. Good that, that the Linux community has been fairly positive at, towards new things, including the commercial efforts. Hi, I'm Hi. from Brazil, and Hi. I would like to know what can we do to bring you to Brazil in May next year. Can you come to the VA, the, the VA party Wednesday night? I will almost certainly be there. Yes, okay. but I need to go. To bring See you later. I, I'm hearing that you're going shooting during the. Well, party. you come with us, man. No. <laughs> The thing is that people expect other people to to be nice and 
take care of things. And I think I don't think that is true, and I don't think that it should be true. And and I think the power of Linux is that uh, even if nobody else helps you an inch of the way, mm -hmm. you still have your own copy of Linux, and you still have your own power to to do whatever you want. And that partly just because I want to avoid. Uh, the politics of Linux. I don't. I want to be somebody that everybody agrees is uh, a nice guy, and he doesn't bash it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just one last question. Sure. Uh, I'm from India. Do you get a lot of developers from India contributing to the kernel? Not that many. Uh, what is the message that you would like to give them so that you get more and more of them? I think one of the problems is just infrastructure. They don't even necessarily have internet access, or they have very slow internet access. And I, I think that people are also uh, maybe not used to to do this collaboration on the internet, and they're kind of nervous, right? Any message you want to give them, motivate them to get more of those developers? I don't know what the issues are in India. There, there are going to be issues that are like local issues that Indians want to be able to, to do things that the American the continent doesn't care about it at all, and I think that's really motivational when, when somebody says, "Hey, I can solve this, and I can make my own version of Linux, and it will be better for me, right, as an Indian or as a just whatever person," and and that's how you should be motivated. And whatever I say, you should not care. You want to find okay. our first-hand Linux? Thanks. Thanks. What Indian problems are just, you? Just, yeah. I don't just want one more. No. <laughs> just one. No. Sorry. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs> you come down to India next time. I will try to, but I will. I will. Take I will take a holiday. Take a holiday. Take a holiday. Okay. Okay. And if you want to end, take a picture for Dutch, uh, <laughs> Dutch magazines. Yeah. Okay. Are you planning on coming to the Netherlands? The real value of Linux may be somewhere else than knocking Microsoft out. Linux was designed to run on a cheap hardware and to solve common problems. If you are poor, it is a real alternative, free of charge. Linux projects started in Europe and the United States. But by now, free software allows it to find ever more new programmers from new sources, from regions where computing is still in its infancy.因为你也知道中国这个整个在信息产业方面在世界就比较落后啊落后于世界那个发达国家有很大的距离那么中国在发展过程中希望尽快赶上去那么赶上去的话我们要有借助国外的很多经验那么其中比如说对于操作系统我
they, they can make so much money from working as programmers that they have the time to devote to their own hobbies. Programmers like Alan Cox, they could name their price. Here are these people who are at the top of the heap and you know, through the structure of transfer of intellectual property that they've come up with, they are transferring that wealth. You know, it is socialism in action, even if the libertarians you know, are, are horrified whenever that is, 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 is mentioned. Open source projects have been compared to the way science is created. Science in itself doesn't make money. The wealth comes as a result of applications. For the open source hackers, developing Linux has traditionally been a science-like voluntary project, a hobby. Eventually, the best Linux hackers were enlisted. In 1999, during the dot-com boom, some of the Linux companies went public. Wall Street announced record-breaking value for Linux stock. Of course it didn't last, but for a period of time, some Linux hackers were filthy rich, on paper. Just about everyone who was a core developer before all this hoopla about people making money doing Linux is that they've kept to their values in, in taking these jobs. Um, most of us, at least the, the ones that I keep in contact with, have a very cushy position and pretty much are doing all the Linux work they were doing before they had a job and within the same uh, levels of freedom as well. So I still read, got changes from people every day the same way I always did. I still submitted them to Linux the same way I always did before the IPO. Some of us are driving nicer cars than beforehand. That's the only difference. And maybe we're eating a little bit more sushi. There are some people who got lucky, joined the right company at the right time, managed to participate in the IPO lottery. Um, and there are some people who got millions of dollars. And there are some people who got billions of dollars. And you know, did those people actually contribute more to the company than those other people? In some cases, they just happen to contribute the right amount of investment money at the right time. And I think that's a generic problem. It's not unique to the open source community. Um, and I, I don't know that we actually have a good solution for that. Part of what I like about uh, Silicon Valley is just that it's so dynamic. And you can do anything here. And even the, the money-grabbing approach, I mean, even if it's slightly tasteless, especially when you come from Europe, it's, it's a really good motivational factor and it's a really good way of getting things done. Has it changed me? I, I assume so. I mean, it's not the same. I'm not the same person I was when I moved. But, but I don't think it's made me all that more money conscious than I used to be. It was 2001, imagined by Stanley Kubrick, in the most ambitious and grotesque PR stunt in history, suicide hijackers blitz America with far-reaching consequences. IT recession affects also open source. No longer does Linus have to act in public all the time as an enlightened philosopher ruler harassed by the media. But the coolness of Linux still intact. The phenomenon disappears into gadgets, invisible pieces of technology for households and entertainment industry. Gradually, many of us turn into Linux users when the code infiltrates our clocks, toasters and mobile phones. As for bigger ideals, it could be one of the greatest missed opportunities of our times. If free software liberated nothing but code. There's no question that 
development of technology is just going to make Linux obsolete at some point. And the question is just how long will it take? Andy, yo, eat the crust. been five years, will it be in 15 years, or will it be in 50 years? And uh, I think one of the powers of open source is that in 50 years, the next operating system that's the best at the time will be able to take advantage of the source base that, that Linux had. I mean, the source code itself is, is to some degree the memory of Linux, and, and people can always use that as a kind of blueprint. But there's more than that. There's also the, the intangible issues about why things were designed certain ways. And, and I think those certainly are out there, even, even if I weren't out there. will get people thinking Let's look in the little room and setting Start to imagine a Bible movie light And by the language we're swearing And eating and chatting It's like this that it happens Like this that we see Big changes through the human history Not by some powerful returns to treat Babotonic, incremental degrees And Mr. Linus goes to Washington To speak about praxis Wretched chains, little man and universal access Linus gains Goliath with nothing else to fill A sling a little stone in the face of Big Bill But Linus Chaffers is good as strings that lose and it changes the way the world plays the blues. It's like this that it happens, like this that we see. Big changes through the human history. Not by some powerful dictator's decree, but the tiny incremental decrees. Like a butterfly in Helsinki fluttering its wings Producing hammerhead stone clouds over Beijing When hammer like programs become a community And information achieves its manifest destiny But to be free It's like this that it happens, like this that we see Big changes through a human history Led by some powerful dictator's decree By the tiny incremental decrees It's like this that it happens, like this that we see Big changes through a human history Led by some powerful dictator's decree By the tiny incremental Big please, it's like this that it happens But that's what we see We change this through our human history It's like this that it happens Like this that we see We change this through our human 